Hello and welcome to another wonderful adventure of the New York City Category Theory Seminar. And today we have Morgan Rogers talking about topuses of topological monoid actions. Take it away, Morgan. Thanks very much, Nelson. And thanks again for the invitation. So um, I, my name is Morgan Rogers. I am originally from Shrewsbury in the UK. I did my undergrad degree uh, in Cambridge my master's as well. I did my um, PhD in the little town of Como in the north of Italy. Okay. And right now I am in Paris, uh, where I work at the Laboratoire d'Informatique de Paris Nord. Very nice, very nice. Um, so let's begin. This talk is about um, some work that I did in my thesis. Um, it's more of the heavy duty stuff. Obviously, you can tell from the title that it's a topos theory talk, uh, and there will be some topos theory scattered through it. But the focus is really on the kind of monoid side, because the aim of my thesis was to show was was to give an algebraic perspective on toposes and to see how you can build them uh, in this way. So um, let's first see the a motivating special case of what I mean by that. Um, so in this talk, we're first going to talk about categories of actions of monoids specifically, and then of topological monoids. Uh, we're going to see how starting from a topos of actions of a topological monoid, and given the monoid that's acting, we can actually reconstruct a top the topology from the data of the toposes. Um, then we can show that we can actually throw away the monoid entirely, uh, as long as we keep some of the data about the topos around, namely the canonical point of the topos. I'm going to show that we d describe sites for these toposes. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to sh relate th this way of constructing toposes to some other uh, classical topics in topos theory, namely that of classifying toposes and from there, derive um, some semi Galois theory. Um, and it'll become clearer what that means when we get there. So don't be intimidated by that. The very first thing we're going to look at are the most basic type of topos you could meet that you can encounter without even knowing what the word topos means. So if I have a monoid, I can view this as a one object category. That's a nice basic realization for anyone meeting category theory for the first time. Um, but if I have a category, then I can build other categories out of it uh, as functor categories. And what a special such functor category um, is the category of functors from my one object category, M, into the, the category of sets. And I take contravariant functors, so I denote it m offset. Now, viewing this algebraically, um, what does an object in here look like? Well, it picks out a set, and then each element of the monoid is an arrow in this category, and so that has to become an endomorphism of that set. And so we see that there's a correspondence between functors, contravariant functors from the monoid into the category of sets, and right actions of the monoid. So the only thing you have to check is, is that the variance is what I'm telling you it is. Um, but that means if you're familiar with actions of monoids, and perhaps more familiar with the special case of actions of groups, pardon me, um, then this should be a category that's quite nice to work in. Okay. So one thing that we can do uh, to, to make this situation more exciting is to put a topology on our monoid. Um, so ordinarily we think of a monoid as a set with some uh, multiplication operation. Uh, and so if we have a set, we can obviously put a topology on it. Um, now, you might, as, as a modern mathematician, be more comfortable with thinking of a monoid internal to the category, a category of topological spaces of your preference. Uh, and we'll see that actually it doesn't matter. But for the time being, it simplifies things 
uh, specifically, it simplifies the definition I'm about to give. If I take the topology as being data on top of the monoid. So given, given this topology tau, uh, I can ask for continuity of actions. Um, so I can take an action and remember from, from algebra class that I can view an action as a mapping from M cross X, where X is the set being acted on, into X, satisfying certain properties, namely uh, that of associativity, so that when I multiply elements of a monoid um, and then act, it's the same as acting uh, in sequence by those elements. Um, and so if I endow the set with the discrete topology, then I have some, some spaces around and I can ask when this map is continuous, and I can look at the full subcategory of um, my right M sets on those M sets which are continuous with respect to this topology. And by definition of it being a full subcategory, uh, I have this inclusion functor and everything's great. So this, I'm claiming that this is an example of a great indeed topos. If you don't know what one of those is, I will hand wave what it is later, but I, I made sure that it's not important for this part of the talk for you to understand that. Um, the point is, it's a category that you could be interested in. Just one second. Uh, uh, the set, uh, the, 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 the right M sets are discrete things. So what do you mean by continuous? Um, I mean, anything works if, if they're discrete. So I'm saying if I think of an action as a map from M cross X into X, then I can equip M cross X with the product of this topology tau and the discrete topology on X. Right. And I can ask for the map to be continuous with respect to that topology. Right. So you're just saying that the, the forgetful map is continuous in that sense. I understand, but uh, it's hard to see why any map wouldn't work since since the so you're going from a you're going from a, a topological space to a discrete space okay so yeah people, i understand okay fine sorry okay good no that's all right I, i'll i'll, I'll get, i'm about to give more detail on what the conditions are for uh an m set to be continuous anyway so it's it's good that you preempted that uh so moving right along um before we get to looking in more detail about what it means to be continuous, um, already this is a, a reasonable definition of a category derived from a monoid with a topology. And whenever I have a way of constructing a category out of some data, I can say that two different um, choices of that, that data are Morita equivalent, this name being motivated by the case of categories of modules for rings, uh, where we say they're Morita equivalent if their categories of modules are equivalent. Here we say that monoids with topologies are Morita equivalent if their categories of actions on sets are equivalent. So isomorphic monoids, obviously equipped with the corresponding topologies, are Morita equivalent. That's straightforward. Um, and really, the reason we introduced this notion. Sorry, even without topology, you can ask about when two M, when two categories of M sets are equivalent. So you can talk about when two monoids are Morita equivalent, right? Yep. And is there a, an easy way to say that when they are? Uh, so you can reduce, you can boil it down to a nice algebraic condition. Um, namely, their Morita equivalent. Whenever two monoids are Morita equivalent, each is a sub semi group of the other um, of the form E M E, where E is an idempotent element. Uh, and we also need to be able to decompose that idempotent E uh, into a pair of elements which have inverses on the, on the other sides, respectively. Um, if you remind me at the end, I can. Uh, I can find a slide somewhere which has that condition explicitly. No, um, that, it's, that sounds close enough to ring theory to be probably true. <laughs> yeah. You know, okay. Fine. Yeah, the condition does look a, a lot like the condition of Morita equivalence for rings. Right. Um, but in fact, the, the story is slightly more complicated. So there, there was a talk, I, I mentioned that I was uh, at the University of Ottawa seminar recently. Um, 
hang on. No, it must have been a, it must have been a semi group forum talk. Uh, but I showed that discreteness is not a Morita invariant property. So bef before I go into detail about that anecdote, um, we say a property of topological monoids, which is recoverable from its category of actions. That is, um, if I take a monoid and I produce its category of continuous actions, and I can say by just looking at that category, the monoid which generated this must have this property, um, then such a property is Morita invariant. That is to say, any monoid which generates that, that category must have that property. Um, now, as, as stated, like, that that's, might seem to be a, a, a not very exciting thing to look at because I could always equip a monoid with the indiscrete topology and that will give me something Morita equivalent to the, the trivial monoid. Um, and so there are no interesting purely algebraic Morita invariant properties. Um, so instead what we'll do is we'll uh, construct representative monoids, so kind of completions of monoids, and we'll look at properties of those. And so our Morita invariant properties will be, um, will be properties of the completions of monoids rather than directly of the monoids themselves. Um, so what I was about to say is in, in a talk I gave recently, uh, of which, the, which said the first half with this one, I showed that discreteness is not a Morita invariant property, which is to say that I have discrete monoids, uh, which are Morita equivalent to monoids which are not discrete. So even though I, I mentioned the, um, the nice algebraic condition um, for two discrete monoids, uh, where I'm ignoring the topology to be Morita equivalent, I can have other non-trivial topological monoids uh, which are Morita equivalent to those. Um, okay, so let's go back to what it means for an M set to be continuous in the first place because I was a little bit vague about it. Um, so once again, I have my monoid, it's equipped with the topology tau and I have an M set um, so I can look at, uh, if I take a singleton element x, little x in, in this set, big x, uh, I can consider its inverse image along the action map, uh, and that will produce the set of pairs um, y, m, such that y times m is x. Um, in particular, in order for this to be continuous, it's sufficient. I, I can always present one of those in, in this form. Um, and so an M set is continuous if and only if all of the, uh, all, all of the sets of this form are open in the topology. Um, so I, I said they only have to be open. Obviously, if you observe that these partition M, so I fixed X and I'm indexing by another element of M. And so the, these sets IXP partition the monoid. And so if they're all open, then they're automatically all closed. That's why they're called necessary clopens. Um, now this condition is quite handy because it gives a hint of how given an arbitrary M set, we can produce a continuous M set from it, right? And we're essentially gonna do the obvious thing of looking at the continuous elements of that M set. So those X's for which all of these do happen to be open. Um, and if we put those together, we actually get a right adjoint to this inclusion of the continuous M sets into the category of all M sets, having discarded the topology. Uh, moreover, we can observe some other things about this functor, uh, that it preserves finite limits. That's just a nice property of, of topologies um, having finite intersections, more or less. Um, and it's co-monadic, which comes for free once we know that it's faithful that these categories have enough limits, uh, enough co-limits rather. Um, Uh, actually, both are fine. So all in all, 
what we find uh, is, is this picture, right? I've, I've just constructed the right-hand side of this picture. Uh, and in particular, this is co-monadic over a, um, a topos. And so this is a, a topos by a well-known result that I'm going to mention again very shortly. Uh, so even before reminding you what a Grote and topos is, I'm going to mention geometric morphisms because I've just presented you with a picture where there are a couple of geom geometric morphisms present. So um, a geometric morphism is an adjunction uh, where the left adjoint preserves finite limits. And we, we denote a geometric morphism going in the same direction as its right adjoint. So here we have two geometric morphisms. Uh, this one on the left, uh, it's the bottom adjunction that forms a geometric morphism. And it so happens the left adjoint has an extra adjoint. So we call this an essential geometric morphism. And on the right-hand side, we have another one because part of the, of the result on the previous slide was showing that this, preserves, that this left adjoint V preserves finite limits. Um, and because we can compose adjunctions and when I compose functors that preserve finite limits, they obviously preserve finite limits. I can compose the bottom functors and the, the left adjoints here to get a, uh, a geometric morphism from the category of sets to the um, category of continuous actions. And such a thing is typically called a point. And we're gonna make a lot of use of that point. Um, that's why I'm highlighting it now. So before we make use of that point, what else can we do with just the ingredients in this picture so far? Suppose, for example, that I know what my monode was uh, and I've constructed my category of continuous actions, but I have been a little bit absent-minded and I've forgotten what topology I was using. Um, can I recover it? Well, maybe not exactly, but there is a natural choice. Uh, I can recover a topology contained in the original one, which is generated by clopen sets, um, such that, so, so by complemented elements, that is, uh, which gives me the same category of actions. And this is the coarsest topology producing the same category of actions. Um, so in straightforward terms, I, look at the actions which are continuous, I look at the necessary clopens for those actions, and I generate a topology from those. Um, it so happens that there's a nice way of packaging that all together, uh, which is that, returning to the previous slide, um, I can look at the power set of M, uh, which obviously is the discrete, encodes a discrete topology on M, uh, but actually lives in here, in this category of actions, because the power set has a, well, several natural actions, uh, but the one that we need is the inverse image action where a subset gets sent to, um, a subset of M gets sent to the subset of M of elements such that when I multiply them on the left by a given element P, I obtain uh, an element in the original subset. Um, and if I pass that object around this a junction, um, I get a subset, a sub Boolean algebra, in fact. Uh, and when I generate a topology from that, that's exactly the topology that I'm looking for. Um, but perhaps the topology generated by the necessary clopens is uh, a more intuitive picture of what, of, of what we're constructing here. So, we call this tau tilde, the right action topology induced by tau. I put right in brackets because we're talking about right actions and so there's a handedness here, uh, but I'm pretty much just gonna ignore it because I will not be considering left actions in this talk. So I'm gonna drop the right uh, adjective. Um, and this process is idempotent, which is more obvious using the, the second description of this construction. Um, and so it makes sense to call a topology an action topology if it's equal to the courses topology producing the same actions. Say, um, I have a question, Morgan. Yeah. 
are these uh, uh, things here continuous M sets? Are they? Uh, is it therefore a spread in the sense of Fox? You know, um, is which is which thing a spread? Is, the, is which morphism here a spread? The the map just the canonical structure geometric morphism from this topos continuous M sets to sets. Just, uh, is that a spread in the sense of because that's what it, a spread is if it's generated by the uh, complemented sub objects um oh that's uh, okay so firstly it is a spread but not for the reason you've just said uh it happens to be a spread because um you know what i mean a, i don't know <laughs> uh because it's a um like there's a right, sense of, there's a sense uh, for geometric morphisms that generalizes the notion for maps yeah so i'm wondering no, I'm, I'm, I, I know i know what you're talking about because um me and my collaborator Jens have been um we put out a, a preprint recently where we uh looked at complete spreads and spreads and, and, and oh. all sorts. Yeah. um but in in fact the the you have to be careful here because um unlike when i'm talking when i look at um maps when I look at sheaves on a space, uh, the topology is being used here in a very to, to produce the category in a very different way than it would if I was building this out of the topology directly. So the topology is being used as a condition on objects rather than as a uh, a means of constructing objects. Um, I take back what I said about it being a spread because I think it's uh, it's, it's connected, it's hyper connected. So it's a it's oh in that pure, case um, some yes. other condition. No, so the spreads oh, have to be, be like yeah. that. <laughs> I'm gonna check. <laughs> I'll check later. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, um, thanks for the question. Anyway. Anyway, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so why is this action topology particularly nice? Because it makes M into a topological monoid. So I said near the beginning that we don't need to assume that this tau interacts nicely with M. It's just a topology on top of the underlying sets of the monoid. In fact, when we take this action topology um, coming from our original topology, this is a topological monoid and everything works out great. So we can throw away those monoids with topologies that we started with and just work with topological monoids and we're fine. So another thing that we can do to reduce uh, these representing monoids a little bit is to observe that whenever I have elements of my monoid which are not distinguished by the topology, then when we're acting continuous on, continuously on discrete spaces or on sets with a discrete topology, then those elements, those indistinguishable elements have to act in exactly the same way. Um, which means that I can safely quotient them out. Uh, I can take the Kolmogorov quotient with respect to my topology and I get the same category of actions. Um, so I say a topological monoid M tau is a powder monoid. If this topology is T0 and it's an action topology and I introduce this, this definition because, as you might hope, I can perform these two reductions one after the other and they are nice compa nicely compatible. And so I can reduce any old topological monoid to one of these powder monoids without changing the category of actions. Uh, and so already we're in much better shape. We can look at, uh, we could look at Morita invariant properties of powder monoids and this already eliminates the, the kind of degenerate situation that we saw near the start, where we equipped a monoid with the indiscrete topology, because when I take the corresponding powder monoid, it already collapses that down to the trivial monoid. Um, and so we can see interesting stuff happening. Um, right. So here are a few examples. If I have a discrete monoid, it's obviously a powder monoid because the topology is nice and fine. Uh, actually, pro-discrete monoids are also good enough. Um, so I can take like the pro-finite completion 
or the periodic completion of the integers. So here I'm talking with, um, uh, with addition, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, similarly with natural numbers. Uh, and I can do a, well, I, I mentioned that, that when I take a monoid and I put the indiscrete topology on it, then everything collapses. But actually that's also the case when I take the powder monoid coming from a, um, any connected monoid. So actually this collapses a lot more than just the, the kind of pathological case of the indiscrete topology. If I consider the real numbers, for example, with their usual topology, then whenever I have a connected monoid acting continuously on a discrete space, everything has to be fixed. And so I, I see very quickly that that is Morita equivalent to the trivial monoid. And indeed, collapsing to a powder monoid already uh, establishes that. OK, so now suppose I've been even more absent-minded. And I have not only thrown away the topology, which I used to generate my, my category of continuous actions. I've also forgotten which monoid I even used in the first place. And all I've kept around uh, is this point. So I know what the underlying set uh, of each continuous action is, um, because that was the inverse image functor here. That was the, what the composite um, functor did. Uh, but I've forgotten almost everything else. What can I, what can I do from, from that situation? So actually, I can look at the endomorphisms of this point, um, because this endomorphism monoid, so when I talk about endomorphisms of a geometric morphism, what I mean are the, is the collection of natural transformations from the inverse image functor to itself. So this is the monoid of natural endomorphisms. Um, but if I look at the component of such a natural endomorphism at any given object of E, um, the topos that I know is some category of continuous actions, but I've forgotten which, um, then by, by the definition of a natural transformation, um, I end up with endomorphisms of that set, right? And so I have a monoid that acts very naturally on the inverse image along P of all of the objects of E. Um, and moreover, I can take, I can look at the, the composite morphism that I end up with. Um, so I'm sweeping under the rug the fact that all of these factors are nice geometric morphisms. Um, I can take the hyperconnected part uh, and that by performing the same procedure that we saw earlier, or that I described earlier at least, I can find a topology. Uh, which is the coarsest topology such that all of these actions of L are continuous. Fantastic. Um, and what we end up deducing uh, with also some work that I, I am sweeping under the rug because we need to consider the comparison between the original generating monoid and this new monoid that I've just built in order to establish this. Um, but the conclusion is that uh, this point expresses E as a category of continuous actions for some topological monoid, if and only if this final factor uh, in, the, in this picture that I've just built is an equivalence. Right? And so this, this monoid that I've just described the construction of um, is a canonical representing topological monoid for this category as soon as that's something that makes sense, right? As soon as, it, it, as, soon as I know that it is a category of continuous actions. Um, um. Go ahead. It sounded like someone was gonna say something. Uh, so this, this thing that I've constructed I get a comparison homomorphism, monoid homomorphism, from whatever monoid I started with, if I uh, happen to come across in my notes what it was after all. Um, and so this is really is a completion process. Um, and that's not just a, a name that I'm giving because of the kind of abstract state of things. Actually, if I look at some nice examples, for example, if I take the integers 
and I take the topology where all of the non-trivial subgroups are open, um, and I look at the continuous actions, and I construct the corresponding complete monoid, I get the profinite completion of the integers. This uh, example of a powder monoid that I gave earlier. Um, and so I get something that we're familiar with thinking of a as a completion for other reasons, right? And, and that phenomenon of it looking like a, a completion in, in some other topological or, or the theoretic sense um, crops up quite a lot. Okay, so now that we have our canonical representatives, right, all I needed to reconstruct these complete monoids was a point. Um, and so I can ask for Morita invariant properties of not topological monoids, but their completions. Um, so this remark is saying what I've essentially just said, that the complete monoid is entirely determined by um, the canonical point that we use to construct it. Uh, and so really, we're just talking about which points are possible uh, for a topos that we know is a category of act continuous actions for some topological model. Uh, so here are some examples that we can give already of properties that we can show in Morita invariant. This has like a feeling of um, Tanaka duality. You're reconstructing the the um, the the group from from its forgetful functor in some sense yeah um and in fact we'll see a, another anal analogous thing later when i talk about some some galois theory uh or one of the ways of constructing galois theory uh, that my phd advisor uh wrote a paper on it's very much a what we're trying to do here is say if all I know is the forgetful functor, can I extract enough information from that to reconstruct the group that produced this information, or in this case the monoid? So, uh, a, 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 and what's the relationship between this and the Yoneda lemma? I mean, you know, there is uh, uh, aren't you reconstructing? Uh, you know, C set to the C app. I mean, aren't you reconstructing C in some sense? Um, I will return to that question in the next section. Okay. Okay. The, the, the main the main issue that we have is in the example I gave on the very first slide of pre sheaves on a monoid. I do, in fact, have this representable. Like the the monoid lives in the category of pre sheaves, right? But as soon as I have a non-trivial topology, the, the monoid itself is not going to be continuous as a set with the discrete action. The, the multiplication is not going to be continuous with respect to any non-trivial topology. And so that representable object disappears. And all of the, the, the construction that I've just given of complete monoids is the, the kind of the gymnastics that we have to perform in order to reconstruct a monoid from what is left of that representable object. Um, so in the next, in the next section, I'll, I'll uh, explain why this is not just a topos, which we know for some kind of general abstract result, but actually a growth unique topos. And you'll see what the site is and, and uh, how, it all, how it all works. Uh, and as a prelude to that, um, here are some Morita invariant properties. So a complete monoid produces a topos of actions which is atomic. Um, so that's a property that's more familiar to topos theorists, but another way of saying it is that the topos is Boolean. Um, and we can show that, that that happens if and only if the group of units in this monoid is dense with respect to the topology, obviously. Um, and the fact that we can show this correspondence because being Boolean is obviously independent of, it is, it's a categorical property. Um, and so obviously invariant under equivalence, that means that any monoid which produces a Boolean topos of continuous actions must have this property. Great, in particular, um, you can observe 
going the other way that if I take a topological group, it produces a category of actions, of continuous actions, which is Boolean. Um, but that is not, a, being a group is not necessary. Um, so if I have a zero element, here's another thing uh, that, that I can examine. I have a complete monoid, it has a zero element, which is to say something that absorbs everything else by multiplication on either side. Um, then whenever this monoid acts on something, then that zero element must send, must act on any element by sending it to a fixed point, right? Because it absorbs anything that I multiply further on, on one side. Um, and we'll see that these principal actions are important and that actually we can reconstruct the complete monoid from its principal actions very shortly uh, as, a, as a limit. And in particular, that means that if I look at the fixed points, uh, any fixed point corresponds to a morphism, an M set homomorphism from the trivial M set with one element. So if I only have one element of my M set, obviously there's only one possible action. But if I have an M set homomorphism from the one element M set, then it has to get sent to something which is still fixed by all of the elements of M. Um, so the fact that all of these have a, a fixed point means that when I reconstruct the complete monoid as a limit of these, I have a cone over it um, from the one element set. And so my complete monoid also has to have a, a fixed point with respect to its uh, action on itself. And so I recover uh, a zero element. I should probably have put this example a bit later in the presentation, to be honest. Um, but the, the point I want to establish is that here is another Morita invariant property that we can obtain using a quite different feeling argument than the one in the preceding, in the preceding example. Um, so before I move on to section four, uh, where I'm going to produce a site for these categories, uh, are there any questions on what's, what I've talked about so far? Okay. Thank you for interrupting uh, with the questions that you have had. It's made it more engaging and it's quite late where I am. So uh, I, it's keeping me awake. <laughs> uh, so I'm finally going to tell you what a growth and deep topos is, <laughs> even though I've been mentioning them uh, frequently this whole time. Um, but I'm not really going to tell you what a growth and deep topos is because I'm not going to tell you what a sheaf is. So a great thing to us is a category of sheaves on some site. Okay, so a site consists of a small category C and a growth and topology J. A growth and topology is a bunch of sieves, which we think of as covering sieves. So um, I was explaining, so it happens that I was explaining this to someone, the notion of sheaf uh, earlier today. Um, so the motivating example of a site, it has the category being the category of open uh, sets in some topological space. And the covering sieves tell us which opens um, cover which other opens. That is the families of opens UI, whose union gives a particular open U would be a covering family over U. Um, and, from this data, we can say what a sheaf is, right? This is a condition on, on pre-sheaves on C, uh, which I have mentioned already. Um, and so an, another way of expressing this definition, which is perhaps more illuminating um, without actually giving the definition of sheaf, is to say that um, a Grotendieck topos is a left exact reflective subcategory of a pre-sheaf topos. So it's a full subcategory, such that the inclusion functor has a left adjoint, and that left adjoint ha uh, preserves finite limits. Right, and I've already told you that this adjunction uh, is exactly the data that we need to, to talk about geometric morphism. And so um, any growth and leak topos comes equipped with, uh, or given a presentation of a growth and leak topos, 
that equips that top boss with a, a, a geometric morphism to a pre sheet top boss. So fine, technical definition that you either have seen before and this is all familiar or that wasn't particularly helpful. Uh, what I really want to highlight about this picture is that it's the other way round from the picture that I constructed earlier. So if I'm thinking of E as my category of continuous actions, uh, then I saw that E would have a geometric morphism coming into it from my pre sheaves on, on a monoid, right? And so here I'm saying, not only do I have that geometric morphism, I can construct one coming out the other side, okay? Um, so in order to explain how this is constructed, I need to talk about a particular property of geometric morphisms. Um, which I've already kind of alluded to, but I didn't mention by name what this property was called. So a geometric morphism is called hyperconnected. If the left adjoint is full and faithful, and its essential image, that is, when I look at the objects uh, in F, which come from E under this functor F upper star, um, then that collection of objects is closed under subquotients, which is to say under subobjects and under quotient objects. And it turns out that being closed on the subobjects or under quotient objects is enough. Pardon me. Um, and so, like I've, I've already mentioned, that this means that F upper star is chromonadic. And we have a general result that says that if I have a category which is chromonadic over a topos, then that category is itself a topos. Um, but actually, that, that only talks about elementary toposes, right? So I, I gave you the definition of Grotendieck toposes. The reason that we keep the name there is because there is a more general notion of topos, um, which is also studied. Um, and not all elementary toposes are Grotendieck toposes, right? So a priori, all I've, sh all, all I've shown based on well-known results is the fact that um, my category of continuous actions is an elementary topos. Um, but it turns out that the fact that E is produced from a hyperconnected geometric morphism, um, which I'm going to remind you on the, on the next slide, is pretty much exactly what we showed when we constructed the, the geometric morphism that defines the continuous actions. Um, then that's enough to guarantee that the, the codomain topos is a Grotendieck topos as soon as the domain topos is. So how does that work? So saying that the domain topos is a Grotendieck topos means that I have some way of presenting it in terms of a site. Um, and one thing you need to bear in mind is that the Yoneda lemma tells me that when, whenever I have a category, I can embed it into its category of presheaves. Similarly, when I have a site, then each object in, in the category, which is part of the data of the site, still gets mapped to an object. I, I still have a natural representable uh, sheaf living in, in the Grotendieck Peak top topos that comes from a site. Um, and given some mild, relatively mild conditions on the Grotendieck topology, um, actually the, the inclusion of those objects is, is still full and faithful, right? So I can think of C, uh, the, the category underlying the site, as living inside the, the Grotendieck topos that I'm building. So fine, I have some site representing F, but I'm going to extend it a little bit by closing under quotients. So when I pass the Grotendieck topos from this site, uh, there are going to be more quotient objects in general. Um, and so I add all of those, and I get a bigger site, and uh, there are some, some nice results, such as the, the comparison lemma, uh, which say that I can restrict to, to that expanded site, and it's still a site for the same topos, right? I've just found another way of expressing F. Um, but now, as long as the site that I'm, I've built is closed under quotients, uh, then when I look at the representable objects which happen to lie in E, that is, which are in the essential image of F upper star, then 
that gives me a, a subcategory of this extended site. And I can restrict the, the topology, the data of the covering sieves to that um, subcategory. And doing a little bit of extra work, uh, I can show that the result is a site for E and that D will moreover be closed under, um, for example, quotients and some, some other constructions, depending on how nice this site CJ is. Um, so why does this work? What's really happening here? Uh, when I build a growth unique topos, all of the objects are kind of formal co-limits of objects coming from the site. And when I have a hyperconnected geometric morphism, that's saying that E, well, because E is a full subcategory of F, every object of E is still built from objects coming from F under co-limits. But because E is closed under sub-objects, um, when I express E as a co-limit of the representables in F, uh, I can actually take all of the um, factorizations of the morphisms coming from the, those representables. Uh, so I can actually think of the objects of E as being um, co-limits of their sub-objects, right? Sub-objects which, in particular, are quotients of the representables. But because I close on other quotients, these are also representables. Um, and because E is closed on the sub-objects, these are quotients of representables that live in E. So the quotients of representables living in E are enough to reconstruct all of the objects of E. Uh, and that's, that's how this construction works. So what does that look like in the particular case that we're interested in? Um, well, I, I'm reminding you that the, this geometric morphism that we saw earlier is hyperconnected. Uh, so the canonical site of, well, the most natural site for uh, the pre-sheaves pre -sheaves on the monoid M is just to take the monoid M and the trivial topology on it, right? Essentially, just take the category M, right? So what does this look like in, in thinking of it as an M set? It looks like M acting by multiplication uh, on itself on the right. And when I take quotients of this, they're, they're quotients of M as a right M set. And so if I look at the identity element of M, that has to get mapped somewhere. And being a quotient, it's subjective. And so everything else is the image of, of that resulting element. And so I get the principal M sets, the M sets which is generated by a single element. And that's all of the quotients. Um, so the natural site that I get for the continuous M sets uh, is just the collection of principal M sets which are continuous with respect to the topology tau. Um, right, and notice I'm a little bit behind on time, if I'm supposed to be stopping at the hour. Uh, but I'll just take it at my own pace. Uh, and then if, you, if you'd like me to stop, that's fine. I'll, I'll provide some natural stopping points. No, no, go on, go on. Go so, the site that we end up with has some special, rather nice properties. Um, and here's, here's a list of them. So firstly, there is a strict epi mono factorization system. That's literally just the restriction of the factorization system for those principal M sets living in, in the topos. I can restrict it by, by how I've constructed this site. Um, because of how continuity works, uh, whenever I have two continuous principal M sets, um, I can't directly combine them into uh, a further one. But what I can do is I can take their product and I can look at the principal M set generated by the pair, a pair of generators, so for the respective M sets. And that gives me an M set which, admit, which has epimorphisms to the principal M sets I started with. Uh, that's what I mean by this joint strict covering property. Um, so going, actually going back to the previous line, uh, the non-trivial result here is that when I restrict down to just looking at this category of principal M sets, uh, the epimorphism, the morphisms which came from epimorphisms in the topos 
are the strict epimorphisms in this new site, and the, mono, the monomorphisms are in correspondence. That's why this, this all works out. Um, there's also the fact that the strict epimorphisms are stable. So there are a few things that I mean by that. One is that uh, composites of strict epimorphisms are strict. Another is that whenever I have a strict epimorphism and another morphism with the same codomain, then I can complete that to a square uh, where the, oppos the morphism opposite uh, the original strict epimorphism is still a strict epimorphism. So this site doesn't this category doesn't necessarily have pullbacks, but I can still always complete squares contain where uh, the right hand morphism. I realize I'm gesturing the wrong way around uh, relative to the camera. Um, wherever the right hand morphism is a strict epic. And finally, this topology that I, I end up with. Um, a priori, it's, it's obtained by restricting the topology coming from the topos, right? I look at the jointly um, covering families in the topos and I restrict them, but it turns out that this topology is generated by the strict epimorphisms. So I, I can take covering, covering sieves with single generators, uh, which is a, particular, a particularly nice type of topology to work with. Um, okay. So now that I've, I've shown you how we can build these categories of continuous actions, that they're toposes, that they're growth and leak toposes, that we have uh, nice and int quite intuitive sites for them. Uh, I mean, principal M sets are probably the, the nicest thing that you could hope to work with. Um, I'm not gonna relate this to other topics in topos theory. Um, so, there's, there's a good reason for doing this independently of just saying, well, you know, if you're looking at toposes, you should probably look at classifying toposes. Um, the main one being that while I have a construction of complete monoids, all I needed was my point with sufficiently nice properties in order to be able to re reconstruct uh, the complete monoid as a topologization of the endomorphisms of that point, actually finding a concrete description of the resulting monoid from that is pretty challenging. I can express it as a limit. In my experience, that limit has always been gross to actually compute or, or work with. Um, but as soon as we identify the topos of actions with the classifying topos for some theory, then that point becomes a model of the theory and the natural, trans the natural endomorphisms of the point become the endomorphisms of the model of the theory. And that can be much easier to get a grip on. So here's the motivating example of, of that happening. And then we'll see some, some more examples beyond that. So this first paragraph is what I've just said, that computing the monoid in a way that's useful uh, is challenging. So the Chanuel topos is quite a famous example of a, um, a great unique topos. Uh, the, the relevant description of it for, for the purposes of this example is as the classifying topos for infinite decidable objects. I can also express it as the category of sheaves for the atomic topology on the category of finite sets and injections between those. So, when I say this is the classifying topos for infinite decidable objects, that means that the, the points of this topos, I'm gonna to remind you what classifying topos is in a minute, don't worry. Um, points of this topos correspond to infinite sets. And it turns out like this is not true in general, but for, for this particular example, any such point uh, has the form required to express this topos as a topos of actions of a topological monoid. Um, and the, the monoids I end up with are monoids of injective endomorphisms of these infinite sets, right? Because as I was just alluding to, when I look at the point that gives me an infinite set, the endomorphisms of that point are just the endomorphisms of that set, but they have to be the T-model endomorphisms, 
Uh, and so the fact that the theory is not just the infinite object, but the infinite decidable object means that the, um, the transformations which respect the decidable structure uh, are only the injective endomorphisms. That's where, that's where this comes from. Also, the topologies, the, the topology there and that I end up with on, the, on these monoids, um, I can express in terms of the, the infinite sets that I'm acting on, um, because a basic open neighborhood of a given endomorphism F uh, is the collection of all of the endomorphisms which match F on a given finite collection of elements. So if I take the collection to be empty, then I get all of the endomorphisms, right? Because they all match F nowhere <laughs> at, the, at the very least. Uh, if I take a single element, then I get all of the endomorphisms which are equal to F on the, when evaluated at that element and so on, right? The more elements I include, the, the smaller the basic open I, I am looking at. So, okay, let me remind you what a classifying topos is. Uh, a growth link topos classifies a geometric theory T. If you don't know what I mean by geometric theory, that's fine, think algebraic because I'm only really gonna talk about um, algebraic examples. Um, if whenever I have any topos F, I have an equivalence between the category of geometric morphisms between F and E, which I've kind of already alluded to, the, the objects are the, the geometric morphisms, the morphisms are the natural transformations between the upper star functors. I have an equivalence between that category and the category of models of T inside F. Um, so th the fact that this is a notion which makes sense is not intuitively obvious when you're encountering topuses for the first time. Um, but it's a very useful fact that every growth the topos classifies some theory, some geometric theory, right? The reason I talk about geometric theories is because this is a fragment of logic expressive enough to produce a theory for any growth and topos. Um, and once I have a theory that's classified by E, there are typically many, then a point of that topos is a model of that theory in the category of sets. So we've just seen a, a concrete example of what that looks like. Um, and I've already explained at length why that is a, a useful correspondence to have at our disposal. So if I want to find theories which are classified by the toposes I'm interested in to actually make use of this, um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I can extend any point of a sheaf topos over a site to a point of the um, corresponding pre-sheaf topos. Right? I'm going to use the presentation that I built um, of this topos in terms of a site uh, in order to help me find such theories. Uh, so for example, the, the reason this is like a useful thing to do is there's kind of a generic theory that's quite easy to describe, um, which is classified by a, a given pre-sheaf topos, the theory of flat functors on C. These are also called filtering functors. Um, and I can identify the, the points of this category with the, the flat functors from C to set, uh, or equivalently with formal uh, directed co-limits of objects in C op. Okay, that's, that's what I mean by in C op. It's the, the category constructed from C op by formally adjoining directed co-limits. Um, now, that's the generic case actually for reasonable choices of C, or if I'm particularly motivated by um, particular theories, maybe I already know uh, that, that, that I have a theory of pre-sheaf type, so I have a category C that I'm interested in, um, then I can, I can find theories which are a little bit shorter to describe because the formal theory of flat functors on a category C which is reasonably large is, well, at least as big as C, put it that way. Um, and then this, this subtopos, 
this category of sheaves classifies a quotient of the theory T, which is just obtained from T by adding axioms and nothing else. Like I'm not adding um, anything to the signature. Uh, I'm, I'm just adding axioms, which the ingredients of the theory has to additionally satisfy. Um, okay, I have six-ish slides left. Yeah, I might as well try and try and get to the uh, examples towards the end. Um, so to make this a bit quicker, I'm not going to consider an arbitrary site. Like we want to know. There's a, there's a kind of secondary motivation here that I haven't really mentioned, which is I also want to be able to identify when a given growth in the topos can be expressed as a category of monoid actions because that gives me another way of presenting that topos, which is great if that's the topos I really want to understand. Having another means of presenting it um, gives me an extra set of tools that I can use. Um, but rather than trying to tackle that challenge for an arbitrary site, I'm going to restrict it to one that looks roughly like um, the kind of site that we that we built earlier. So already, I want there to be an orthogonal factorization system. Um, I need that left class to be stable in the sense I described earlier. I want that right class to be contained in the class of monomorphisms. Um, I'm not actually sure how necessary this is. It's, it's crucial in one part of uh, a proof, but I'm not sure whether it can be removed or not. Um, I need the equivalent of the covering property that I described, and I want this topology to be the one built from T in the analogous way to what I saw with the strict epimorphisms. Um, and so given such a site and a theory which is classified by the pre-sheaves on the category in the site, um, the quotient theory actually has quite a nice description. Um, in order to explicitly describe it, I need to identify uh, the objects of C with formulae uh, in, in terms of the signature uh, of T. Um, which is, takes a little bit of setup that I'm not going to do. Uh, but essentially, all I have to do is add an axiom for each T morphism. Uh, probably calling both of these things T was not great for the purposes of exposition. But for each um, calligraphic T morphism. Um, OK, now I do some really technical stuff. <coughs> I observe that. When I have the factorization system, then I also have a factorization system on the opposite category. And I can extend that to the end completion. So when I take the formal directed co-limits, then actually that provides me with a way of factorizing the, the morphisms um, between the, the, the formal co-limits of the objects of C op. Um, so I can extend this factorization system to in C op. And the reason I want to do this is because after, after a lot of work, um, it enables me to produce conditions um, on a site of this form, uh, which completely avoid talking about monoids um, in order for there to exist a presenting monoid for, this, for the resulting category of sheaves. So, um, I will either let you ask me about these conditions later um, or guess what they mean. Uh, injectivity should be a familiar property of uh, objects in, the, in, a, in a category. So asking for injectivity with respect to a certain class of morphisms is exactly what it sounds like. Um, I've said what our universal is here. So I've extended um, things coming from calligraphic T into the right hand side of the factorization system here. So I'm saying that uh, I'm, I'm looking for an object here which admits an R morphism from all of the uh, representable things, all of the things coming from C op. Um, and finally, I'm looking for an object which can be expressed as a, the director co limit of a, a diagram who, all of whose morphisms lie in calligraphic T op. So because I've rushed into this, it might, be, it might not be entirely clear why I'm 
talking about this inductive completion in the first place. So the reason this comes up is, is what I mentioned a few slides ago, uh, which is that the, the points of uh, this pre-sheaf category correspond to objects of this int completion. Um, and I want to think of them as objects of the int completion because that gives me a nice formal way of constructing them. Uh, but the important thing here is that each object gives me a point. And remember that I'm looking for a point of this sheaf category, which by extension gives me a point of this pre-sheaf topos. Right? So these conditions ensure, firstly, that this point restricts to the sheaf topos, and then that it has the right conditions um, to express that sheaf category as a category of continuous actions. Um, and altogether, uh, this, this condition is, well, the, these conditions are semi-Galois, produ produce a semi-Galois theory, which is to say a way of assigning a topological monoid to uh, a, some categorical data. Um, and I'm going to skip this example. I just want to say that if I have a site satisfying the conditions that I've described, and the, the category is countable, then those conditions are sufficient. I don't think that's true in general, um, at least not constructively. But uh, for count countable sites, um, the conditions that I described earlier are, are sufficient. And so I do get a representing monoid. OK, um, here are some examples. I gave the uh, a presentation of simplicial sets, which may be interesting. I gave a, a presentation of co-simplicial sets, uh, which may also be interesting. And I've alluded to uh, the fact that I reckon there should be a lot more examples, but um, I haven't finished producing them. Uh, so with that, thanks for listening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick question from me. Um, what's what's the semi about this uh, Galois theory? What's missing, or what what would Galois theory reproduce that semi isn't semi? -Galois? Okay, so ordinarily Galois theory gives me a correspondence between um, objects of some category and subgroups of some group. Um, and here, what I end up with is uh, a correspondence between objects of some category and not sub monoids, but principal actions or <coughs> dualizing a little bit uh, families of congru congruences on a, uh, a monoid. So the semi and semi Galois is p adding semi to group. I'm producing a, a semi group rather than a, a group in this correspondence. Okay, good. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, could you go back to the uh, simplex slide just so I could look at it? Um, but yep. yeah, I'm not going to ask you to talk about it, but there's a lot going on here. And I'm, it's, it's too bad you had to rush through the end. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I agree. Well, I, st I still have time to actually do it. I just want to cover the extra details that people are actually interested in hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so to go through this, uh, basically how this works is if I look at the simplex category, I have a split epi split monofactorization system. Um, I, I just need to go down, quotient, uh, identify all the elements that are identified by a given morphism, and then inject, um, and everything, everything works. Uh, but because when I take uh, split epimorphisms, these are in particular strict, but when I generate the topology from those, um, then I just get the maximal sieves, I just get the trivial topology. And so the category of sheaves for, for this site co coincides with just simplicial sets. Um, so now I use the fact that I know a theory that is classified by this, uh, the theory of bounded total orders, by which I mean total orders with a bottom and top element. Um, and I mean, I didn't describe how the, the construction works for, for the countable sites. Um, but what I'm looking for is a, a bounded total order 
right, a, a model of this theory, um, which satisfies the, the properties that I've described, uh, namely that whenever I have a split epi uh, between, um, between these bounded total orders, um, I can extend along it. Uh, and, and I mean, this object will do. Uh, I sh it should be noted that the construction of the object is, is not unique. Uh, so there could well be others, but this is the, the one that I found when I was um, trying to keep myself awake before, before this. Uh, and so as soon as we found an, a model with, with the properties that we need, then the endomorphisms of that model um, give me the monoid I'm looking for, and I need to do a little bit of extra work to, to figure out what the topology is. Um, it's possible there's some mild mistakes here, but to me what's interesting is I haven't seen a presentation of um, simple sets that looks anything like this. So um, I wish I'd thought to check this example when I was finishing writing my thesis because I'm sure someone would have asked me about it in my defense. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Anyways, thank you. It's a very interesting talk. Thank you. It was very understandable, very clear also. Um, okay. Well, there was a question you asked me earlier that um, I said I would come back to if you remember to ask me. Um, it was, you, you mentioned about, oh, ten, I asked you about, uh, Yablo, uh, not Yablo, uh, Yoneda, and you answered that. And then I asked you about Tanaka duality. Ah. Um, yes, yeah, so what I was alluding to there uh, is the fact that in, yeah, yeah, so so that was kind of the complete uh, monoid stuff. I, I'm not sure there's necessarily more to say, but what I was alluding to is the fact that in this Galois theory, uh, so the, the, the special case of atomic sites produces the, um, allows you to produce a group rather than just a monoid. Um, and so this is another situation where I'm using the fact that I have a nice enough functor to the category of sets in order to rebuild the, the group starting from um, the, the category that I'm interested in. That was the analogy that I wanted to mention. Right. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, give a plug for next week. Uh, Jason Parker is talking about enriched structure semantic adjunct and modad theory equivalences for subcategories of varieties, uh, whatever. Anyways, uh, something slightly related there. Um, anyways, um, I hope to see you all next week. Thank you very much. Morgan, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upload it and I'll send you an email.